Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our November edition of our monthly IFRS webinars. Um, as always, I have with me the lovely Ashley Woodley from Perth, um, and then I also have Kevin, I can say, my lovely partner in, um, in Sydney as well. So hello, Ashley, and hello, Kevin. Hello, Aletta. Aletta hello, Kevin. Ashley. And hello, lovely everybody just... on the webinar. And, and Aletta, as you mentioned earlier, it's the first time in almost, what is it, two years that we're all in the office. We are all in the office, not in the same office, but a letter is not sitting at home in Melbourne. Kevin is not sitting at home in Sydney. And as always, Ashley is in the office in Perth, right? Um, so I think we should all move there, Ashley. Um, so we all in our- Sorry, I, I haven't office. shared your excitement in being in the office. <laughs> We are so excited. It's my second day back and I'm having fun. Um, but welcome everybody to our webinar. This is a really important webinar because we're doing our accounting standards update to help you to get ready for 31 December 2021 reporting season. Uh, so, you know, a, a really important one. Um, as I've said, you've got our three presenters and uh, you've got our contact details there as well. Now, today's agenda, uh, we have 12 sections that we'll be covering, uh, which are on the slide. However, I want to give you a bit of background um, or explain our approach. Now, during the year, we've issued monthly accounting newsletters with an amazing number of, of articles covering all the latest developments. Um, during the year, we've done monthly IFRS webinars where we've covered all the latest and greatest. So today is not a repeat of the accounting news. It's not a repeat of all our um, IFRS webinars. It is a very high level flyover where we are saying, um, these are all the things to think about um, before you get down into the nitty gritty of 31 December reporting. We do it in November, so you've got time to plan. Um, so it's like a completeness test if you come from an audit background. Uh, it's a completeness test. Uh, we run through it all. Some of them you might say, I have to read more. I have to go back to accounting news. Some of them you might say, it's got nothing to do with me. Um, move on. And that's okay. So we're not going into depth today. We're going high level flyover. So what I've actually done, I printed it out. I'm in the office, so I'm wasting paper. Um, and I've printed all the slides off, two slides per page. It forms a nice little booklet. Um, and I think it's a nice little booklet to step through and say, so what do I have to think about? What do I have to plan for? And what are the things that's just not relevant to my business? Uh, so this is going to be fast. It's going to be fun. Um, and it's all the latest and greatest. So um, before we do that, I want to flag, however, that for our not-for-profit clients, um, what we talk about today is relevant for you because, you know, we've got industry and sector neutrality in Australia. But then we also have, in addition to that, a number of very specific not-for-profit issues. So play, please stay tuned today, but also please register for our not-for-profit specific webinar Thursday the 9th of December. It's an hour and a half. And it's an hour and a half because for the first hour, Anthony White, our national a leader for not-for-profits and I will be talking about accounting standards and finance matters. And then for the next half an hour, we'll have a panel discussion where Ashley Bleeker will talk about corporate reporting, impact reporting, ESG. Uh, Elizabeth Blunt is an audit partner, Ben Renshaw from People Advisory, um, and Tom Fazio from Risk Advisory will join us and it will be a panel discussion on what they are seeing when they work with their not-for-profit clients. Um, so it's not just accounting standards, um, it is much broader than that. So please register for that. Um, so we've put in some of the things that we'll be talking about with our not-for-profit clients. So increased reporting threshold, thresholds, etc. So please don't miss that webinar if you're a not-for-profit entity. So first of all, Kevin, over to you. 
and we go back to transitioning from special purpose financial statements to general purpose financials, which is now a real reality in Australia. 30 June um, 2022 and potentially for those who want to early adopt 31 December 2021. Right. Thanks, Aleta. And a couple of points. One is um, I will be in Melbourne on the 9th of December when you are doing the not-for-profit webinar. So I will be sitting in the room next door, banging on the door when you get something wrong um, <laughs> um, in, in that webinar. So challenge challenge accepted. And also, Chris, uh, Letta will be talking sustainability later. And I am challenging a letter that her sustainability measure in the new year will be to print less when she's in the office. <laughs> Let's move on to transitioning from special purpose. Um, and as Aleta said, this is this is almost outside of transitional requirements. Now, this is a reality. If you're a for-profit entity, it's going to happen. And if you've got a June 2020 year rent, for example, that's when it's going to happen. You're in it. You're in it now. You're almost. I, 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 I want to go as far as saying that you've probably missed the transitional relief that existed. But let's just talk high level. High level is. If you are an, an entity that is, is for profit and you're lodging your accounts, is a rule of thumb, but there's a little bit more on the screen about who the suppliers to, but a good rule of thumb is if you're lodging with a regulator, let's say with ASIC, and you're for profit and you're still using special purpose, this is probably your biggest challenge in the next sort of six to eight months is you will need to be on general purpose financials. And the, the big trick on this one is don't just think this is a disclosure issue. And that's really my that that's really my sort of message today. We've been talking about this for some time. There's a lot of information out there uh, um, in terms of resourcing. Um, I think a letter, um, you've got some slides coming up on resourcing, which we'll skip over and just say to you that the links are all there for you to follow in terms of accounting news and so forth. But when are when is these required? If you're a for-profit and you're on special purpose and you're essentially lodging under some regulatory requirement like ASIC, you're probably going to be here. Yes, there's also some constitutional requirements for some sort of trusts that might be rolled up and I'd say that if you have a concern over that you should probably reach out I'm not going to get into the detail for now jumping to the next slide just to keep us rolling um, there, there, there are tier one and tier two requirements now tier one and tier two requirements have always sort of existed or have existed for some time but the tier two requirements are the ones that that, that at the same time that you're moving from special purpose to general purpose if you're moving to tier two and you don't have public accountability this is where the new what's called simplified disclosure comes in we used to call it reduced disclosure and it's going to be called simplified disclosure it is a brand new standard um, and also it's not the same as reduced disclosure and this is where the problems are coming in with the transition There's a lot of organizations think ah it's just a disclosure change and really the disclosures haven't really changed much from before well they actually have there's a lot more in there so that so the reduced disclosure has become simplified mostly because they're not <coughs> reduced anymore as much as they used to be but they are simplified um, versus full ifrs and the full ifrs still applies or the full double asp still applies to tier one um, which most organizations who have public accountability will probably be there already. So I don't, I don't really think there's yeah. going to be much there. It, it's your special to general for your tier twos um, that you, that you need, need to worry about. Um, as we say, it replaces it from 1 July 2021. And what we mean by that is in your first financial year after that, which will be June 2022 um, and thereafter. Now, a letter loves the slides. I hate the slide. When a letter puts it on, there's lots of color and there's lots of writing, but it is a very good guide to follow where you are. The takeaway for everyone who's listening today is don't just treat this as a disclosure change. You need to make sure that your recognition and measurement are right. And what has happened in the past is that special purpose entities who were claiming compliance with recognition and measurement weren't always um, actually complying. Um, and this process is designed to ensure that when you go on to simplified disclosure and you move to tier two general purpose or even tier one from special purpose, you do actually need to go through the, the, the process of checking that your recognition and measurement, even, even if you claim compliance before, whether it actually is in compliance. And we are finding, I'd say the vast majority of organizations I've worked with who are moving from special to general have actually found problems in their recognition and measurement in, 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 in terms of recognition and measurement requirements. When I say recognition and measurement, is everything on the balance sheet that should be or not on the balance sheet that should be? And has everything been measured in accordance with the rules? Fair value, costless depreciation, goodwill impairment tests, those compliance issues 
which a lot of organizations under special purpose have claimed compliance with, haven't complied with them in the past. And this process is designed to check that. And that is why we say, don't just jump to disclosure in this. You need to go through this process. I'm going to go as far as to say, Aletta and Ashley, um, that this is the big issue um, um, for your December year ends to look at. And this is probably your big issue if you have to do this in the next eight to 12 months, probably the biggest thing. Start now, don't leave it too late. Aletta, I'm going to whip now through in the interest of time to the next few slides and just kind of throw, show you how we've put this together. These will link through to all the bits and pieces uh, and resources we have. Here's the famous five-step successful GF, GFFS transition. Don't start with the last step. Start at the top, work it through. And there are, are a, a number of steps along the way, like the gap analysis and the health check, um, and even the assessment that we can help you with in various forms to try and understand, you know, sort of what needs to happen. I always am a good, uh, I, like, I, I like to kind of put the health check as my big BD because the health check is something we do, and I've done quite a few of these now, where we don't necessarily jump straight into, here's all the problems, how are we gonna solve it? But we at least try and find out if you're gonna have a problem and we present you with options before you actually commit to a path on how are you gonna fix this? Um, so the health check and the assessments are two really interesting steps that you can take where you can actually decide, look, what are the issues? And before I even figure out how to solve it, what are my options? And sometimes we go back and forth between those steps a few times to find the easiest option or the most effective option based on stage of life of the entity. And that's why I say don't leave this late because those can take a couple of weeks and sometimes months to get through depending on how the stakeholders need to be engaged. Um, but take, take, take that on board. Simplified disclosure, it is the last step. It is if you're moving from reduced disclosure onto simplified or if you're moving from special purpose onto simplified, it has to be done. So anybody who's coming on to IFRS that's not doing tier one um, public accountability um, uh, disclosure will be under tier two. And, and bearing in mind, I, I should probably say this just again, this does apply to for profits, but it also applies to anyone who's a not for profit who's already here. So if you're on tier two and you're a not for profit, this is going to affect you, but it doesn't necessarily affect those not for profits who are special purposes who aren't yet moving. Now, let's, I'm, going, I'm not gonna really get into it, but this is tricky for the not-for-profits and this is probably gonna be covered by a letter and the, and the gang next time in the webinar we, we put forward. But if you're a not-for-profit and you're already on tier two, let's say reduced disclosure, you are gonna to have to move now um, on, on to 1060, so simplified. But if you're on special purpose not-for-profit, there's special rules there. And, and it's gonna be a little bit longer before you have to get onto this. And there is some voluntary options, but there's also no real mandatory transition. So if you're a not-for-profit and you're listening to this and you're a bit confused, the webinar next month is gonna be the one you wanna to listen to because there's some special provisions around there. But if you're here already, you need to, you need to get from RDR to special purpose, uh, to simplify disclosure, you gotta go and you gotta go do this. Now, the, the, the important thing here is to, is to realize that there are new disclosure requirements and they are things that the, the reduced disclosure are not necessarily been looking at um, in the past. I'm thinking like fair value disclosures, um, financial instrument disclosures, um, and also things like um, key management personnel disclosures in terms of salaries or totals of salaries and so forth. That wasn't there before. Resourcing, click, 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 click. It's all there and, and available. And I think with that, I'm gonna just put this out and let you can jump in here, but we've got a disclosure management tool that can assist you. It's designed, it, 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 it's a management tool that you can work through to make sure that you are meeting all the simplified disclosures, give you peace of mind about where you are, tailored questions along the way, and it's a great audit trail. If your auditors wanna see what you've done, and if you're looking for sort of a roadmap to how you actually get to um, compliance with the, the simple disclosures, the links are there to find out some more. A letter will talk you through this um, as well as I, but, but, but Chum, she's the product owner in the sense that she knows this intimately because her and her team um, at the national level designed this. So she, like, she knows this completely. So give us a call um, and it is there for your use if you'd like to. I'm gonna say that I'm done with my first section and hand it back to, I think it's a letter, um, or maybe Ashley. Thank yep, you very much, Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> okay, you oh, go, um, Ashley. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And well done to sticking to the time frame. Um, okay, so standards applicable for the first time at 31 December, 2021. 
uh, four standards. That's it. So that's the number of standards that are mandatory for this reporting period. The one you should focus on is the second one here, COVID-19 related rent concessions beyond 30 June 2021. So we recommend that you adopt this early and I'll explain why. Um, but firstly, quick recap on the COVID-19 related rent concessions up to 30 June 2021. So from our experience, most of our clients or most organisations early adopted this in their 2020 financial statements. In your slides, a letter has put together various resources addressing different examples of the rent concessions um, and the different accounting outcomes for these. But what I wanted to focus this session on was the amendment which now extends this practical expedient by 12 months. Yes, so previously, lessees receiving rent concessions due to COVID-19 could only use the practical expedient if there was a reduction in lease payments due before 30 June 2021. So the extension um, now means that lessees receiving ongoing rent concessions due to the extended lockdowns can choose the easier option not to treat the reductions as lease modifications. So the key takeaway from this amendment, it's only available if you had previously applied the original practical expedient to eligible contracts with similar characteristics and in similar circumstances. So this is most easily explained through looking at three different scenarios, which is on the next slide, I think. Yes, that's right. Um, so scenarios one and two, relatively straightforward. If you previously elected not to apply the practical expedient, you now cannot apply the extended practical expedient. And then conversely, if you did apply the original, you must now apply the extended for second wave rent concessions received. Scenario three on this slide is the one to focus on here. The amendments allow an accounting policy choice. If you previously were not eligible for the original practical expedient because the rent concessions went beyond 30 June 2021, the rent concession would have been treated as a modification. Now, with this amendment, you have a choice to retrospectively apply the extended practical expedient. The advantage of this is you have a choice of whether you recognise the benefit now or spread the benefit over future lease term. Okay, um, the next one, interest rate benchmark reform, phase two. So this is the next new applicable standard. Um, what is this and how does it impact us in Australia? Uh, so let me just very high level explain. Um, so a number of benchmark rates around the world are changing. Many contracts may not have contemplated any mechanism for changing the rates. Therefore, if you have any contracts linked to currencies impacted by the reform, you are going to need to deal with this reform. And the IASB has acknowledged that this is causing issues and has introduced amendments to deal with it. So the phase one amendments previously dealt with the uncertainty introduced by IBOR reform. Phase two, which is what we're looking at here, um, these are now applicable. They deal with issues associated with changing interest rates in contracts. It introduces practical expedients to allow for sensible outcomes in transitioning to new benchmark rates. So on the next slide, we've got the standards that are impacted. Oh, we might not have included that one, um, but we've got a list of standards, I think in your slide deck um, and yes, that's the one, thanks Aletta. Um, and then explanations on the sensible outcomes that the amendment introduces. So actually, seems, yes, I, th I thought it's interesting. You know, libel reform has really uh, confused me, um, and I'm really lucky that I've got a husband to work at a big bank. So I had a conversation with him recently and said, "What's going on here?" Um, and he said, "You know, in Australia, most of our agreements." Um, loan agreements, funding agreements, etc., would re refer to BBSW, right? Bank bill swap rates plus a certain percentage. 
Um, however, there's also a lot of entities, um, in particular in the natural resources or mm -hmm. if they are part of global groups, where they don't refer to an interest rate, which is BBSW plus a percentage, it's actually LIBOR plus a percentage, so the London Interbank Offered Rate. Um, and the fact that LIBOR is now being phased out is because a lot of banks could potentially manipulate that and they say, let's get rid of the manipulation and let's go to a risk-free rate. Um, so, you know, I think if, if you're an organisation um, that, um, you know, just go and look at all your funding and land agreements, is the link to BBSW, which is common in Australia, plus a percentage? Or maybe if you're part of a global group or raising funds overseas, you might be referring to LIBOR. And then we should start to think, you know, if LIBOR is phased out, what does it mean for you? And in particular, if you on on top of that, if you are entering into hedging arrangements to hedge these LIBOR um, rights, that's where it gets really tricky. Um, so I thought yeah. I should just add a little bit of a flavour on who should worry about this. Mm -hmm. can, can I add yes. some more flavour? Because if, since yes. the letter piled in, I may as well just go for it. Um, <laughs> it's an interesting one because the, the, the comment of a letter where you're saying you're part of an international group happens to also be an, uh, the sorts of entities that are going from special purpose to general purpose at the moment. So it kind of comes back to the to, to yeah. what we're talking about is you're a special purpose. You might be a small sort of branch out here in the in, in, in the backwaters of Australia versus your international holding company in Europe or somewhere like that. And, and exactly what a letter said is you're going from special purpose to general purpose, and you've got funding that's denominated in, let's say, a LIBOR, and we're picking those up when we do the health checks as part of the transition yeah. from special to general. And the interesting thing about these is when you're going from special purpose to general purpose as part of the transition um, uh, to, to, to general purpose as transitioning, you don't get the transitional amendment uh, amendments on these on these standards that Ashley's currently doing, you have to go back and restate two years in some cases. And so we found a, a quite a number of those in the last few weeks where international funding, small special purpose, Australian entity, part of a group, and their funding is impacted by the interest rate benchmark because their funding is denominated in LIBOR, in LIBOR or some other type of international um, mm. currency, and they are having to restate and they look like a small entity which doesn't have big issues. So please, please mm -hmm. think about this when you do those sorts of transitions as well. That's my two. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. We're hearing from our overseas colleagues who have been dealing with this already um, that the practical application is complex. And like Aletta said, particularly if your hedging arrangements are impacted. So I think key takeaway, um, reach out if you have contracts that are impacted by the benchmark reform. Um, significant issues can arise when trying to put this into practice. The fourth um, and final amendment, so this addresses the accounting for service concession arrangement by a grantor that is a public, center, public sector entity. Um, we've included details in your slide deck, so I don't think I'll go into this one in any detail. If we can skip over, um, <clears throat> yeah, so let's let's now explore new standards issued, but not yet effective. Uh, okay, so firstly, you may be thinking, why? Why is it important to go through these standards now when they're not even applicable yet? Um, well, some hot tips for you. Uh, not only are the disclosures required around future estimated impact of these changes, but it may be very beneficial to you to early adopt some of these standards. And if you're going through the transition from special purpose to general purpose anyway, it might be very worthwhile to go through this exercise as well. So there are several new standards available. Um, all of them are detailed in your slides, but let me highlight the ones that I think are really important. So firstly, the orange box, annual improvements to IFRS standards. Uh, Unsurprisingly, as the heading suggests, these changes introduce improvements to existing standards. The one I want to draw your attention to is the second bullet point, amendments to AASB 9. So this amendment clarifies that fees included 
in the 10% test, which I will explain. Um, so the fees included are limited to fees paid or received between the borrower and the lender. So why is this important? Well, it could be critical to your accounts. The 10% test determines whether modifications to a financial liability will result in de-recognition of that financial liability. And this can create large volatility in your P&L. So this amendment is important because it clarifies that the fees incurred on the modification paid to third parties are excluded from the 10% test, meaning that the 10% threshold may not be breached. So if you have this situation, if it may be relevant for your financials, it's handy to know that early adoption of this amendment is permitted. The next important one, um, AASB 137 in relation to onerous contracts. So to understand this amendment, it's firstly important to look at the definition of an onerous contract, um, which is currently a contract in which the unavoidable costs of meeting the obligations under the contract exceed the economic benefits expected to be received. So the key points, it's a contract where unavoidable costs exceed the benefits. And then unavoidable costs is defined as the lower of the cost of fulfilling the contract and any compensation arising from failure to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. So from our experience, issues arise in the application of this concept as AASB 137 currently does not specify which cost to include in determining the cost of fulfilling a contract. So as such, the standard has been amended, which is available for early adoption now, um, to add clarification of what makes up these costs and that addresses the implementation issues. On to the next slide, we've got amendments to AASB 116. Um, so this one, this one I think is the critical one for this section. Um, it's an amendment that is already raising a lot of queries and from what we've seen has widespread and quite significant impacts for many clients. Under the current standard, net proceeds from selling items produced while constructing an item of PP&E are deducted from the cost of the asset. In practice, this resulted in a lot of diversity, hence this amendment has been put forward um, and the amendment prohibits this and instead requires the proceeds as well as the costs of such items be recognised in the P&L. So what we're seeing, um, the biggest hurdle in the application of this amendment is that isolating these costs may be challenging in practice. So it may require monitoring of costs not previously required and more extensive estimation and judgment. So it's mandatory um, as at 1 January 2022, so definitely one to start looking at now. Um, okay, so let's just skip over the next couple and we'll have a look at estimates, um, which have been amended under AASB 108. So the amendment is to clarify the definition of an accounting estimate, um, which makes it easier to differentiate from an accounting policy. So why is this important? Um, well, it's important because their treatment and disclosure requirements are different. A change in an accounting estimate is applied prospectively, whereas a change in accounting policy is generally applied retrospectively. So here on the slide, we've got a diagram representing the amendments to explain that a change in an input or measurement technique is considered a change in accounting estimate. So for example, if you change a valuation technique used to measure the fair value of an investment property from market approach to income approach, this is treated as a change in estimate rather than change in accounting policy. And then the final significant change to share with you is, um, so we've got insurance contracts here. There's a lot of information um, in the slide deck and on the website. So I, I won't go through that one, but leave that for your reading. Um, deferred tax assets and liabilities. Again, um, that can be some self-reading. 
but the one, the other one I wanted to highlight is the amendment to IAS 1, classification of liabilities as current or non-current. So what is really important here is the first bullet point, the entity's right to defer settlement must exist at the end of the reporting period. So at the reporting period, there must be a right to defer settlement. Management expectation or intention does not affect the classification of liabilities. This is a crucial change to start thinking about now as not only can the presentation of your balance sheet be impacted, but it can have far greater impacts um, if, for example, covenants are dependent on working capital positions. So that covers the most critical um, new standards that I wanted to address. Let's not forget the changes that are applicable now, the changes that are coming up and whether you can early adopt any of these to your advantage and the importance of understanding how these future changes will impact on your future reporting. Okay, Aletta, um, over to you, I think, for insights applicable for listed entities. Thank you very much for that, Ashley. Uh, if we look at listed entities, we've identified two things to really think about for 31 December. The one is around the JobKeeper Section 323DB notice and also um, a slight change to remuneration reports. So I'll look at them briefly. Now the JobKeeper one, I know we've had a a specific um, email that went out to our clients about this one. It's been in the newsletter. So all listed entities um, that's received JobKeeper uh, during the past two financial years must file a Section 323DB notice with the ASX. Um, ASIC has actually come out and, and issued a form that has to be completed to make the process a bit easier and details on exactly what should be submitted. Um, now, because this change came out fairly recently, um, there are some dates to be uh, to, to look out for. So if you've lodged your annual report before the 14th of September 2021, uh, so this would have been, um, you know, if you've I would assume lodged your 30 June um, 2021 report before 14 September 2021. Um, then you have to submit this form by 12 November 2021. So you get 60 days um, from the 14th of September. Um, if you haven't lodged it yet by the 14th of September, and maybe you lodged it on the 30th of September 2021, uh, that's when the 60 days start. So within 60 days from the date that you lodge it. So it's quite important to know whether you've lodged your report before or after 14 September, very important date. Um, we've got in some examples to just focus on the reporting dates and the significance of the reporting dates. So in this example, if we've assumed that the listed entity had a 30 June year end and it received JobKeeper payments during 30 June 2020 financial year and 30 June 2021 financial year, um, you have to put in a notice and you must put in information that separate your JobKeeper payments for each financial year. So it's important to note here that we don't say you only report JobKeeper received during your most recent financial year. Um, if you've received JobKeeper over the last two financial years, you have to report for both of them. Um, and then we've just locked, looked at, you know, depends on when you've lodged it. If you've, if you've lodged your 2021 annual report by 31 August 2021, you've got 60 days from 14 September. If you've lodged it on the 30th September, you've got 60 days from the 30th of September. For me, the key thing here in this example is actually the fact that you have to disclose this information information for both financial years, not just the latest one. Um, we also have another one uh, where we again focus on, on, on the dates. So let's say you had a 31 December year end, uh, which many of our attendees today might have. If you've lodged your 2020 annual report by 28 February 2021, um, you now have 60 days from the 14th of September 2021 uh, to lodge this information. Um, 
clearly um, for 31 December year ends, you wouldn't have lodged your 2021 annual report yet. Um, but as soon as you lodge it, you will have 60 days uh, to then also report uh, the JobKeeper information for 2021. Um, so your 2020 information, uh, you'll have to submit that by, 40, um, by 12 November 2021. And for the 2021 financial year, you've got 60 days. So it's a slightly more complicated for 31 December year ends because they'll potentially have to do two lots of lodgements to deal with the two financial years. Um, if we look at remuneration reports, um, there's no change uh, to Section 300A or the regulation. However, there's a change to the listing rules. And the ASX listing rule 10.15.11 um, requires the remuneration report to disclose and to note that securities, which would mean shares or options, that have been granted to directors or other persons in a position of significant influence were approved at an AGM under ASX listing rule 1014. Um, so it's important that we make a positive statement to say, listen, all these shares and options um, to KMP, to these significant people have indeed been approved. Um, so it's a slight amendment to the need to disclose that. So. It was always required to be approved, but there's now also a requirement to make a positive statement that it was indeed approved. So that's for listed entities, I think the two biggest disclosure related issues. Um, Kevin, we back to you on IFRIC agenda decisions during 2021. Again, a high level flyover of these. Right, Alessa, and I, I, wa I wonder if I can just make a social commentary at this point. So a letter was just talking about the listed and job keep listed disclosures and job keeper. Uh, and I guess there's a lot of debate out there about disclosures of job keeper, whether it be listed or unlisted, I, I guess some voluntary disclosures and so forth. But I actually sat in a meeting, it's a bit of a yarn, I'm going to tell you, I sat in a meeting yesterday where the CFO was lamenting um, about sustainability reporting and made the point that um, the disclosure of job keeper information is essentially a social and a governance issue because what you're doing is disclosing the use of public money and so forth. And so those of you who are listening out about that and having a conundrum in your head about the disclosure, bear that in mind when it gets to the sustainability issue because it is all about transparency and and, and, there, and there's some big issues there. So Alessa, you take, take that one. It was a really interesting discussion about the link of job keeper to shall we call it the S and the G in ESG reporting. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So on the Africa agenda decision. So let's just talk about what these are. Um, I mean, at a very high level, um, the uh, International Financial Reporting Interpretations Committee is um, another body of the international standards so, or another committee that essentially gets questions, fact patterns of in-practice issues where they then get asked various in, uh, information about how do the accounting standards apply to this. And these decisions are then issued by the committee where they debate them and, and, and they essentially look at um, these practice issues and essentially clarify how the accounting standards, the basis of conclusions of the accounting standards apply to that specific fact pattern um, for clarity, because it's not always clear how the accounting standards apply. Now, these have become very pervasive in the application of IFRS. I mean, I, 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 I want to say it goes as far as to say that they are authoritative guidance, but, but, but really what it really means is, is that the, the specific fact pattern that's sitting with the, at the interpretation committee that gets decided on and published essentially becomes, shall we call it rule of law, after that for that specific fact pattern. Now, not everybody has that specific fact pattern in practice, but there's a lot of very useful information from this committee about similar fact patterns that may be applied in practice in the application of accounting standards. Long story short is you should not apply IFRS without considering these agenda decisions. You might have a you might have an exact fact pattern, in which case you really should be applying it exactly. You might have a similar fact pattern, in which case there might be some markers there that you should be taking into account when you design your policies on how to apply certain events and conditions when, when preparing your financial statements. But the rule of thumb here is that really when, when these decisions are issued, 
um, if they apply to you, um, they really should be applied um, by the next reporting date. And that is ASIC expectation in Australia as well. So um, the takeaway from this slide is if you have similar issues to this or exact fact patterns to these that I'm going to deal with now, you really should be looking at them for December 31 um, to make sure you, 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 you know, you're applying these correctly. Now, these are the topics. There's links here to our news articles. I'll just run through the topics quickly. I'm not going to cover all the slides here. But um, non-refundable value-added taxes on leases. Now, this is an international standard setter, but, but don't be fooled by the value-added tax bit. Um, the value-added tax bit is a consumption tax, really, and so we have something similar in Australia, which is the GST. So there is some similarity there. So it's not completely irrelevant. Um, and, and this this particular one is an example or fact pattern that deals with input taxes. Um, on, on certain supplies. And as you can see, I let put the slide together um, or, or our national team put, um, put this together. And we've actually referred to the GST here and the ATO because obviously there's relevance in Australia on the GST level and the ATO level. And the, the real question is when your lease liability, lease payments include um, these input amounts for GST, whether you actually need to include them in the measurement of your lease liability under the lease accounting standard IFRS 16. Now, the, 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 the agenda decision seems to be that this is not really widespread, but I've got to say, I get this question all the time, so it seems a lot more widespread than yeah. the international standard setter thinks it is, because, because it's, it, it's a real question. You are actually paying these amounts in your lease payments. And the question really is, do you include in the lease liability, which obviously is going to drive the lease liability in a certain direction and the associated right of use asset. Now there's essentially two approach and, and, and you can see the preferred approach from um, our point of view is the first one, which really is that these payments are not payments for the right to use the asset. And they actually levy is charged by government. But that actually has a different accounting and there's actually another interpretation that deals with the accounting for levy. So it's quite a complex issue because it's really well, well the, 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 the lease payment is under IFRA 16 and that goes into the lease, uh, the lease uh, uh, liability calculation. The levy is sitting somewhere else in another interpretation 21, which we're saying you should be recognized an expense when incurred. Most organizations that actually asked this question of us never thought about it at the time of adopting IFRS and they've probably done it wrong, which means now what happens is they've got to unwind it. And as you would have seen on the previous slide, um, this is essentially a, 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 a retrospective adjustment once you've realized that you're not do, doing it in accordance with the preferred approach. However, this is an approach driven slide, meaning there might be different interpretations here. If you have this and you're concerned about that this might be material, please reach out on this or look at the material on our website because there is some complications on this one. I'll jump forward then on that one. Um, I think Alessa has got some good slide there. Warrants, at the moment I see warrants, I just go chill, chill down the left side of my body because you know, we're talking about liability and equity classification and they generally come along with convertible notes, whether they're detachable from convertible notes or whether they're standalone instruments. This is a very specific fact pattern and so I'm not going to deal with it per se. And I'm actually not even sure the IFRIC really got down to it. I think they decided it was kind of too narrow to deal with. But mm -hmm. the reason why I'm talking about it is because we are seeing, I, I think I see warrants virtually every week now because the, the old convertible note question was one issue, but now we're having convertible notes which have add-on warrants on top of that. Um, and so there's definitely a question here on how to account for these. I mean, generally speaking, if you're sticking a warrant into equity, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying, just make sure you're not doing it wrong because they could very quickly be a liability and often are. I don't think that the IFRIC agenda decision will help you much. Um, it's more about making you aware of the fact that this issue is still an issue and it keeps coming up even at the inter international level. So if you've got warrants attached um, or options to buy shares later on attached to convertible notes, just make sure you're accounting for those, first of all, and then that you're accounting for them correctly. Um, and so there's a couple of resources there for you to reach out on. Um, I've never done an IFRIC agenda decision session so quickly like I'm doing it now, but I'm telling you, enjoying every minute of this gallop and off we go into the cost necessary to sell inventories. There's a nice little yarn here too, and that is that the inventory standard, which is IS2 or ASV 102, we, we generally don't look at it much in our world. And I'm looking at Aletta and Ashley because it's one of those old standards, you know, standard costing of inventory, exclude abnormal weight. 
um, weighted average or LIFO or FIFOs, you know, all those types of cost measurement standards. And I think when you do when you do accounting at university, it's the second standard you look at after property, plant and equipment. You know, it's one of those traditional standards. We all think we know how to do it. But what's happened along the way is the world changed behind it. So the standard hasn't changed, except for a few places. But what has changed is the world has changed. And I'll give you an example of where this has changed. Supply chains and delivery of goods right now is so up in the air. You've got abnormal costs, delays, abnormal wastage, all those things are happening. And so the traditional inventory costing systems are under strain just because the world has changed behind it. But also what's changed is costs of selling goods. And that's the example in this case. Um, Aleta, if you don't mind just jumping the slide, I, 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 I don't have the, there it is there. Um, the question that came to the IFRIC year was, when estimating net realizable value, so this isn't, this isn't even a question about inventory costing, this is a question about net realizable value, which if you remember correctly, you need to write your inventory down to the lower of cost and net realizable value. The question was, um, what costs are included when determining the costs that are necessary to make the sale? Because the world has changed and the costs that are necessary to make the sale, which must be deducted from NRV according to the standard, are now in some cases very material because you're shipping goods all over the world, you're using different, you're using, um, different uh, methods and, and, and transport methods to get them there. Um, and, and, and so these costs have suddenly become really important um, because they've become material. And the question was, are all costs necessary to make the sale included or only costs that are incremental to the sale? So the IFRIC actually did reach a conclusion on this. Um, all costs that are necessary to make the sale in the ordinary course of business is the answer, which blew up the whole world because many organizations would have probably just been using incremental costs in, um, uh, in this case. But there's a lot of judgment here. And actually, this particular fact pattern from the IFRIC is quite an interesting read if you want to apply this. To be honest with you, I don't think it's as clear as, a, as, as it seems on this slide. I think they've made it more complicated, to be honest. But they've certainly opened the, opened, the, opened the gates to the fact that there's more that's included than we used to in this question. Now, Aleta, Ashley, you can jump in on this one. I don't see this question that often because no one's really asking it. But what's actually happened since this came out, everyone's gone, oh, my goodness. Am I doing this right? And now I'm starting to get questions there. So I think there's a lot of costing systems that perhaps didn't think about this before. And neutralizable value has started to become a real issue versus cost because of supply change, glut, things are sitting in ports and not getting delivered, and suddenly you have an NRV to cost problem. So at your 31 December, please have a look at your NRV to cost, and that includes the costs necessary to make the sale and whether you are actually getting your write downs correct. Um, at your 31 Decembers because of this interpretation and because of what's happening in the in the real world right, right now with supply chain issues and all those types of things. Non-going concern financial statements. I love this one. Um, I, I'll say this one at a very high level. We're essentially talking liquidation basis of accounting here. Now, there isn't anything really in IFRS about what liquidation basis of accounting is. The standards assume it's a going concern basis, but it doesn't prevent some other basis such as liquidation basis of accounting being used to prepare financials. This particular question isn't so much about liquidation as it, as it is about liquidation basis and comparative information. So it's a very niche question. The niche question is, what happens with your comparatives when your basis changes from going concern to something else like with liquidation? And they have reached a conclusion on this, but it also did open up questions along, uh, uh, along um, the lines of, well, what's liquidation basis of account to begin with? A long story um, of this one is if you've if you've moved from a, no, from a going concern to a non-going concern basis of preparation, you should look at this, especially in relation to what your comparatives should look like, because you might have an inconsistent basis of preparation between comparatives, which might have been on a going concern basis, and current accounts, which are liquidation. There is information in there. I'm not going to get into it now. It's more about alerting to, you to the fact that this exists. Um, and I'll leave that to you. I think there's a couple of examples there. SAS implementation costs. I will not spend a lot of time on this because there is a lot of information we have out there on this. But um, uh, in the past, we spent um, lots of, of time on the webinars on this. We've also spent a lot of time in our, in, our, um, in, our, in our news articles. But I will say this, if you have a SaaS implementation project, so software as a service, 
where you are implementing a new system that works through the cloud and T Teams is a great example, Microsoft Teams, and BDO Lead, if you've purchased our software as a service product from, from, uh, from um, BDO to do your lease accounting, it's a SaaS implementation that you're gonna go through. There are configuration and customization costs that you are going to have to incur and the concept of do you capitalize those as intangible assets? This particular question was dealt very clearly by the international standard setter during, well, I'm gonna say during the year, but actually over a number of years, there were a number of issues that the IFRIC Interpretation uh, Committee dealt with and they dealt with these costs. And Australia have had a wholesale restatement of, of capitalizing these costs and essentially expensing them is where we've ended up versus capitalizing them which was sort of the way we did it in Australia before. The 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 the, the takeaway today is that for December year ends there is no real way other than restating now in your December year ends if you've been capitalizing SAS implementation costs um, and they're still sitting as an asset on your balance sheet, whether it be a previous project or one that's currently on the go, you need to very seriously look at whether those costs are entitled to be capitalized, whether they're under a previous uh, project, or, which is still on your balance sheet or one that's currently on there. And you need to check whether you've got an adjustment. And, um, and, and, the, and the real thing here is if you have an adjustment, it's most likely gonna be a retrospective adjustment to your financials in December. ASIC had guidance on this, BDO has got guidance on this, the International Standard Set has got guidance on this, and, uh, and, and I think the answer now is really clear on this, um, which means you've got to take action. And if you haven't taken action for December, I'd say that this is probably a very big um, project for you to get started on right now. And then finally, supply chain financing arrangements. Um, Sometimes you tend to kind of gloss over things as not applicable, but I actually have run into one of these also very recently, um, where, 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 where essentially there's a couple of parties involved, but really you're, you're, you're selling your inventory um, or you're buying your inventory from suppliers and essentially the bank gets involved and essentially financing um, cash flows between the various parties up front or at a later date is essentially a, a sort of a re reverse debt arrangement where you factor your debtors with the bank. There are a lot of them out there and I didn't realize how much this was going on at the, at the shall we call it, at the tier two level. Because we always think this is the sort of thing that these big conglomerates will do, but there's actually a lot of supply chain financing arrangements happening, reverse factoring arrangements of debt or supply, uh, supply chain financing between banks and organization at the sort, sort of small tier, tier two level. And there was some very real questions raised to the IFRIC on how do you account for this, present it, what does your cash flow statement look like? And this was comprehensively answered by IFRIC. I'm not gonna get into the answers, but if you are involved in supply chain finance arrangements, there is a very nice summary that we have on this, on the implications you should be looking for in terms of accounting and presenting financial statements. Please go and have a look at that. Now that is the quickest IFRIC update I've ever done. So handing it now over to ASIC focus areas and FAQs. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. So if we look at ASIC fo focus areas and the FAQs that's been issued by ASIC, uh, first of all, um, we're expecting um, ASIC to announce another extension of reporting deadlines. Um, so for 31 2021 um, year ends, we expect some extension. It's not been announced yet, but we're expecting announcements soon and we'll include it in our accounting news. I think it is important to note that this is um, expected to the last extension of reporting deadlines. Um, so it's like a final hooray, uh, hurrah after COVID-19 extensions. Um, so we'll, we'll communicate that as soon as possible. Um, ASIC has not announced their focused areas for 31 December yet. However, we expect them to be very similar to the key five focus areas that they had for 30 June 2021. So it's around asset values, um, potential impairment and how do we determine fair values. Um, also around provisions and around provisions, I want to say there's a specific emphasis on restoration provisions. 
Um, and in a lot of the work that we do with clients around leases, I think booking restoration provisions or make good provisions at the end of leases uh, maybe has been problematic in the past. Um, I think we've uncovered a lot of those when we initially adopted AASB 16 or IFRS 16 in Australia. Um, but I think there's still an ongoing cleanup process involved there. So these restoration provisions could be um, you know, at the end of a project, it could be when we end out and um, move out of a lease. Uh, so pl please look at that. Um, there's also solvency and going concern assessments, um, subsequent events, and then disclosures in the financial report and operating and financial review. Um, maybe I should put a six area here, and that is I've just heard in recent discussions um, that there's a lot of interest by regulators of all forms, internationally and in Australia, around sustainability reporting. Um, we are saying going forward, communication with stakeholders will be through financial statements, which are audited, and through sustainability reports, which at this stage are voluntary uh, reports and also no specific requirement for audit or assurance. But one would imagine as stakeholders start to rely on financial statements and sustainability reports, they would expect financial statements audited sustainability reports, some level of assurance. Um, and the regulators are also interested in that. And I think it links up to uh, the disclosures in the financial report around operating and financial review, that linkage with what's in the sustainability report. Um, frequently asked questions, we know that ASIC has started during this period of COVID to issue FAQs to try and assist um, preparers and there's been FAQs um, around financial reports and directors reports, around solvency statements, around reporting deadlines and AGMs and virtual AGMs, um, other audit related matters and then also changes to ASIC activities. So I've put in a, a link there, some very useful uh, FAQs to be aware of if you're impacted by COVID. Kevin has just talked about it, but I would have put it out there. This FAQ 9D on cloud computing arrangements is really important. Now, this was issued um, with a particular focus for 30 June financial reporting periods and saying for 30 June reports, um, what is ASIC expectation around looking at those configuration costs and customization costs? And ASIC had an expectation that entities looked at it for 30 June 2021 financial reports. Um, however, if you've got a 31 December 21 year end, I think there's an increased expectation and less of a reason to say we're not ready. Um, so the 30 June 2021 uh, reporters could potentially come up with an argument. We've done a lot of work. The announcement was only April. We're not ready. Uh, we're going to wait to the next financial year. Um, ASIC doesn't like it, but I, I think there's some room to move. 31 December 2021, no room to move. Uh, we knew about this for eight months. Um, so this has to be very high on your radar. Um, and during COVID, we see working from home, we see a lot of people investing a lot of time in doing things more efficient, more effective and remotely. Um, so this is a big spend. Um, the other one that I want to talk about is bed licenses. Now, this is a, a particular big issue for a lot of our not-for-profit clients, but there are also entities um, in the for-profit um, space that have uh, bed licenses. Uh, and we know there's been reforms announced um, and this has been um, announced after, it, there was included in the budget announcements in May, some reference um, that would impact bed license and the removal of bed licenses. Um, and then in September, there were some further announcements to kind of seal the deal. Um, and more details. So there's been a little bit of a discussion, you know, if you've got a 30 June 2021 year end, um, should you start to uh, amortize these bed licenses over its expected useful life up to end of June 2024? Um, is it an adjusting event? Is it a non-adjusting event? What date was the trigger to know that this is going to happen? Um, so again, um, ASIC came out with an FAQ. The big issue here is traditionally in the past, entities 
I would have said um, bed licenses would not have been amortised in definite useful life. Um, going forward, if we know bed licenses are phased out, um, it changed to a specific useful life, um, it will have to be amortised and potentially only up to 30 June 2024. And then, of course, it raises some questions around impairment. So, it, you know, do we have to impair these bed licenses in addition to amortize, start an amortisation process? I also thought it's important to just put on your radar some of the results of the ASIC surveillance of 31 December 2020 financial statements. Um, so you can see the highest number of inquiries were around impairment and other asset values. Some questions raised around expected credit losses on trade receivables, um, some on operating and financial review, consolidation, lease accounting, uh, etc. So just to give you an idea of the things they've asked about, um, you know, just so you can see what the focus is. I do want to make a very specific point about my good provisions. Um, so dilapidation, uh, dilapidation and restoration liabilities. Um, you know, so this is really a, a make good provision is created under IS 37, provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets. And we also have an IFRIC, IFRIC 1, uh, dealing um, with these liabilities and how do we uh, account for changes. Um, I want to put it on your radar, especially if you've got leases. Um, you know, in the in a previous regime, before we had IFRS 16, um, there was also a need to have these provisions and the debit side would have gone to a leasehold improvement. Um, with the implementation of IFRS 16, we know the good thing about IFRS 16, it's put lease accounting and everything to do with leases and governance around leases absolutely on the table. Um, companies are interested in it, auditors are interested in it because it's on the balance sheet. And now suddenly people are saying, okay, we've transitioned to IFRS 16, we've got right of use assets, lease liabilities, but there's something missing here. Where are these make good provisions? Um, so I think in the past, it maybe wasn't that obvious that there's a missing piece in the puzzle and the balance sheet. But now that we've got lease liability, right of use assets, there's an obvious missing piece. And that is, have we considered whether we need make good provisions? Um, so I've included some slides around, you know, when do you recognize it um, at a point in time at the beginning or near the beginning of um, the contract? And when would you do that as opposed to over time as the damage occurs? These principles come out of IAS 37 and it comes out of IFRIC 1. Um, we've put in some examples um, that you could look at. Um, I would say ASIC is looking at this. Um, it's, it's related to a, new, a relatively new standard IFRS 16. A lot of talk about this and this is something to get um, correct as soon as possible. Um, another thing to put on your radar from an ASIC perspective is um, around uh, right of use assets and the fact that um, an AFS licensees and ASIC has come out and said right of use assets can now be included in or accounted for as part of right of um, accounted towards a net assets values adjusted surplus liquid funds and surplus liquid funds. Um, so it's a fa fairly new announcement and it's good news for our AFS clients. So it's just a reminder of that. Um, so we've put in some resources. Um, we've also had an, a, a newsletter on it um, and you can uh, consider that. If we move on to Australian developments, um, you know, some of the big things in Australia specific bed licenses, which we've just discussed. Another big issue is employee leave provisions for casual employees. Um, there's also been changes to non-refundable R&D incentives um, from 1 July 2021. And then obviously the reportable payment times reporting scheme, again, which is very much linked to ESG reporting requirements. Um, so we've talked about bed licenses uh, as part of the ASIC focus areas. I've put in some detailed notes here, um, you know, impact on amortization, impairment, etc. I've put in some references. 
uh, when we look at employee leave provisions, uh, remember last year we've said and we've urged clients to consider booking a leave provision um, if their scenario in practice is very similar to the Rosato case. Um, and it was around casual employees <coughs> that could effectively double dip for entitlements. So we know these casuals receive a loading. Um, but now in certain conditions, the Rosato case said that these casual employees are also, in addition to that, entitled to certain employee benefits. Um, entities never provided for it and we've said, you know, get legal advice. If your facts and circumstances are similar to this, please provide a, you know, consider a booking a provision. However, uh, in August this year, the Rosata decision was overturned in a high court. And therefore, again, it's important to consider legal advice in your specific scenario. Um, how similar is it to Rosato? Do you need a, a, to book a liability? Um, there's also been recent changes to the Fair Work Act um, on this and um, some adjustments to the definition of a casual employee. Um, and then also um, some indication that these changes um, legislative changes are actually retrospective to avoid that double dipping. Um, so again, this is an area to please look at. It's a commercial area, it's a practical area. Um, it's not so much about the accounting standards, but a, a, a commercial um, thing to consider. So a lot of our clients may need to reverse those additional employee benefit provisions that they've created in 2020 financial years, uh, because those were based on the original Rosato decision, um, which has been overturned. So again, we've included an accounting news article on that. Um, I, earlier this year, I presented a webinar on non-refundable R&D incentives um, with an R&D tax partner at BDO, Travis Maddox. Um, and we talked about what does this mean? How does it work? Um, but I just want to put it on your radar that if we have non-refundable R&D incentives, there's three different approaches. Um, and we've explained that in our accounting newsletter. We also have a separate newsletter in October last year around accounting for uh, refundable R&D incentives. Because the tax um, guys um, have seen some changes in how we calculate the amount of this non-refundable R&D incentive, uh, we did discuss, you know, so what does it do for the accounting? And I think our conclusion is um, this change impacts the amount of the incentive, but it doesn't change the fact that for non-refundable R&D incentives, there's three possible accounting treatments um, and somewhat of an accounting policy choice available. We've included an example to flag it with you and to flow it through, and it's also included in an accounting news article. So if you're entitled to R&D incentives, isn't that amazing? Well done. Um, get assistance to claim that. Speak to Travis Maddox, but also consider what are the accounting implications. A reportable payment times uh, scheme is actually a really important thing to make sure that large businesses and large government enterprises pay these smaller entities in, 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 a, in a short period of time to make sure that the money flows through the economy. So I, I actually think this is critically important for small business. Where I am in Melbourne, uh, we know small business, especially small business in the CBD, need in everything um, to get them going, to support them, get them back on their feet. Um, so I think this is a really important initiative. Um, I've put in some slides around income thresholds um, and, and why this is important. Um, so if you're a large end of town, large business, large government organization, there's potential reputational damage here if you're not paying these small businesses within a reasonable um, period of time. And this has to be um, um, you know, lodged, it's been made publicly available. Um, and then we've also put in some information around penalties if you're not complying with these new requirements. So if you're in this big end of town that have to report, the first reporting deadline was 30 September, 2021. Um, if you've missed that, the next one, it's quarterly is end of December. Uh, I think from a penalties perspective, maybe you can argue your way around missing 30 September uh, because it's the first time. Um, but, you know, 
I think from 31 December, there's no way around it. Um, so we've included again some accounting news articles on this. So are you ready for this? And how can we help you? And, and we've got a document and please contact me if you need assistance around it. Really important stuff. Reporting obligations are incre in in increasing um, uh, to get transparency. And you know, the whole ESG movement is driven by transparency. Um, I'm going really fast, it's 10 past 12, but please bear with me, please hang in there. Remember, it's just a completeness check. From a COVID-19 perspective, um, we've got some resources, illustrative financial statements for 31 December 2021. Um, but going with that, we've got a COVID-19 supplement, which is looking at um, specific additional disclosures that could be included around COVID-19. Um, there's a COVID-19 disclosure checklist, which is always useful, um, and some illustrative disclosures specifically focused on COVID-19. It's available on our website. Um, please reach out if you can't find it. Um, we also have a number of articles looking at um, COVID-19. I mean, there's a whole website page on how to account for JobKeeper payments, etc. Uh, you can see two slides just full of um, articles on COVID-19. Now, earlier, um, Ashley talked about the new IFRS um, 17, which is a standard that's been issued but not yet effective. Um, I think that the, the key point I want to make here is that even if you are not an insurer, you should care about IFRS 17. Um, I've had some clients um, during this past busy season where we looked at some of their agreements uh, where they thought it might be within the scope of IS32 or IFRS 9 financial instruments, or maybe they thought it's within the scope of IFRS 15 because it's around warranties. When we looked at it closely and when we reviewed the agreements, it was actually insurance contracts. So IFRS 17 is not written for insurers. IFRS 17 is written for any insurance contract. And there's a little bit of an issue here around whether a contract is within IFRS 15, IS32, IFRS 9 or IFRS 17. Um, so we have to look at these. You know, entities often make promises to other entities. Um, maybe it's loan guarantees, um, but they could give rise to financial instruments or insurance contracts. So we have to look at those promises very carefully. So I've included some slides here all right, around what is a financial instrument, what is an insurance contract, what is a provision IS37, um, which you could look at. Um, but I think this slide is really important. And that is where you're looking at the features. We've got a liability here. The question is, how do we recognize and measure this liability? Is it within IFRS 17 because um, it's an insurance a liability that there's significant insurance risk? Is it a financial instrument? Um, maybe a financial guarantee contract? Is it within the scope of IAS 37? Um, you know, or is it actually um, within IS32 or IFRS 9. I want to put it on your radar. This is not something to ignore. Um, I've also put in how is insurance risk defined um, and it's different to financial risk. Um, and we've also put in, so what is financial risk, by the way? If insurance risk is not financial risk, we need to know what financial risk is. Um, we've also included uh, some examples on something that's an insurance risk and something that's not an insurance risk. So uh, what is an insurance risk? If one company agrees to compensate another company for any loss in the residual fair value of a vehicle belonging to the company as a consequence of the vehicle being damaged by a fire, that is insurance risk. However, if a company A agrees to compensate company B for a loss in the residual uh, value of a vehicle, so it sounds very similar, but excluding changes in the fair value attributable to changes in the physical condition of the vehicle, then it's no longer an insurance risk, it's now a financial risk. Because the vehicle, the, the changes in the fair value of this vehicle is not because there was damage, 
um, it's for some other underlying reason. Um, you know that we know vehicles lose some value over time, etc. So that's a financial risk. That's IFRS 9 potentially. Um, we talk about significant insurance risk. When is an insurance risk significant? So we've included some discussion of that. Um, but I think the key thing, we've got an, um, a section on our website looking at insurance contracts. Remember, not just for insurers, insurance contracts. And we've got a number of newsletter articles. Basically, every month this year, there's been an article on insurance contracts, on how do you identify them and how do you account for them. So please look at that. Um, it is quarter past 12, and we get to my favorite topic, ESG and sustainability reporting. Now, I know you've had enough of me, and I appreciate um uh, that. However, I want to really briefly cover ESG and sustainability reporting, in particular because we've got a new standard setter, um, and that's amazing. Now, I've previously talked about what is the business problem in an earlier webinar, um, I think September, October, uh, I've talked about this. Uh, I think a nice summary is um, if you as an organization ignore ESG, ignore sustainability. It's going to impact your access to capital, investors, funding, whatever. It's going to impact your access to markets, um, so customers, and it's going to impact your access to people, employees. Um, and this is the real business problem. How do we deal with ESG sustainability in order to make sure we continue to have access and easy access to capital markets and people? Um, we believe at BDO an integrated holistic approach is the way. So you have financial statements in accordance with Australian or international accounting standards that are audited, but integrated into that is sustainability reports, which at this, this stage is voluntary and not even a requirement um, around assurance. Previously, I talked about ESG, the factors, there's an article on it. Um, I've also previously talked about all the available frameworks. Um, I love the United Nations one, maybe it's the color, uh, but I absolutely love the way they communicate this um, and how they try to impact, you know, no poverty, how powerful is that? Zero hunger. I love number four, quality education, gender equality number five. Um, so a really powerful way. Um, the World Economic Forum, Principles of governance, the planet, people, prosperity, again, powerful stuff. Uh, we've got the Global Reporting Initiative. Uh, we've got Value Reporting Foundation. Um, what I want to talk about, though, is during COP26, on the 3rd of November, um, the IFRS Foundation, um, or the trustees of this IFRS Foundation, announced the establishment of another accounting standard setting body within the IFRS world. Um, so the IFRS Foundation traditionally had the International Accounting Standards Board that issue IFRS accounting standards. Now they've established an International Sustainability Standards Board within the same house. Um, they call it the IWSB. Um, and um, those and the IWSB will issue IFRSs. IFRS sustainability disclosure standards. So both bodies will issue IFRSs. The one IFRS accounting standards audited and the other one IFRS sustainability disclosure standards, where I imagine we will see some assurance going forward. Um, in the new world, COVID-19, um, this new standard setting body is spread across the globe. I thought that was interesting. Um, and they've actually already issued prototype standards. So they've issued a prototype uh, around general requirements. So similar to what we have in IAS uh, 1, presentation of financial statements. Uh, they've uh, looked at the, the, the table of contents. It reminds you of an accounting standard. And actually, as part of the um, conversation, they've said that these 
prototype standards have been prepared with finance teams in mind. They realize that finance teams have to embrace sustainability disclosures because it's an integrated holistic solution. So this looks like an accounting standard. We all feel comfortable, uh, very similar. So these are general requirements. Let's start generally. And then they've also moved on to climate related disclosures. Now look at this one. The climate related standard 31, 39 pages. However, there's also a technical protocol that goes with it. 581 pages. I nearly had a heart attack. Um, so this is the climate related disclosures. But if you look at the protocols, um, this is the table of contents. And what I wanted to show you here is for different industries, they've put in sample disclosures, sample things to measure and report on. Um, a very useful document. So they've started with general requirements and focused then on climate. And now they're going to look at all the ESG measures. Now, climate for, for my book is one of the 24 ESG measures that we focus on. So they've started with one out of 24, um, but, you know, making good progress. So we're expecting these protocol standards to turn into EDs early next year and then standards towards the end of the year. Um, so where do you start? Um, I'm working with another client, um, a few clients at the moment around, you have to consider your governance framework. Um, you know, do you just want to start this? Do you want to be compliant? Do you want to be proactive? Do you want to be strategic? Or, you know, do you want to be purpose driven? So this is where you have to start. What do you want to do in this space? Um, and we can help you with this. You have to look at who are your stakeholders, all right? So users of financial statements is one thing. We now talk about stakeholders of this holistic communication approach. Who are they? Then we have to speak to them as part of the materiality assessment. What are they interested in? What do they want to see in your communications? Again, it's a process. Um, once you know what they're interested in, what framework they want you to report on, what your competitors are doing, you have to consider what is our current position? Where do we want to go? And what is our roadmap? Um, and you know, we have to be careful of something called greenwashing. We cannot say we're going to do all these amazing things to greenwash our business if we don't have behind that very clear plans and a roadmap on how we're going to achieve that. At BDO, we've got a tool where we can assist you with the measurement and reporting of whatever you want to measure and report within your um, sustainability report. Report. And I should say, we're not expecting every organization to address every sustainability development goal of the United Nations or any or each and every ESG factor. It will depend on your stakeholders, what they're interested in, in what you can influence. And I think that's really important. So our approach, um, I've had it in a few slides, but we've got a seven step approach. Uh, the sixth step is assurance, where we get our insurance partners involved. And number seven, if you want to be purpose driven, um, then we, you, you have to look at monitoring and performance improvement. I'll say this, the clients we're currently working um, with are looking at 30 June 2022 as the first time that they want to report and prepare and report a sustainability report. Um, and we're starting now. Some of them, we've already been working with them for months. This is a big job. You don't do a governance review, a stakeholder engagement, materiality assessment, maturity assessment, roadmap. You don't do that overnight. This is a brave new world. We have to get cracking. Please reach out. We want to work with you on this. Um, so we've got a sustainability section on our website. Uh, we've got a number of articles, bulletins. Uh, about the new standard set, et cetera. Please look at that. Um, a lot of material. Finally, from 30 June reporting, we have some feedback. Um, you know, make good provisions is a big issue. SAS implementation costs, customization costs. Um, another big one is determining whether you're a significant global entity or not. Um, whether you have to do country by country reporting. Leases, disaster. 
um, I mean, people implemented IFRS 16. My group revisions may be overlooked. Um, they did all these calcs in Excel because on day one you maybe can do it in Excel, but now reassessments, modifications, terminations, I'm talking about a dog's breakfast. Um, uh, this is hell on steroids, right? Um, so please speak to us. Uh, and it's quite amazing, actually, the number of calls I'm currently getting where clients are saying, we're dying here, help. Um, so we've got a, a team dedicated and sorting out leases. We've got a fantastic technology solution. It can go to the moon and back. It can do absolutely everything. And we've got an amazing team that just do leases every day. They know it all. So please speak to us. So we can take that pain away. Uh, you focus on your business and we'll do your lease accounting. Um, Share-based payments uh, are problematic. Modifications to revenue agreements. Impairment testing. Going concern. Refinancing. Um, you know, convertible notes. Warranties, as uh, Kevin talked about. Um, SPAC puttables, um, government grants. Um, I mean, there's so many issues um, and we really need to consider these and, and get ready for 31 December reporting. I want to end up with um, Ashley. Uh, Kevin, thank you for sharing your expertise, your time. As always, I uh, love listening to you, love learning from you. Um, you know, at BDO, um, our IFRS leaders, uh, would, would love to help you get ready, get audit ready. So please reach out to us. Um, but also, if you look at our uh, corporate reporting team, I wanted to flag that Ashley Bleeker, a director, has joined our national IFRS and corporate reporting team. Uh, the two of us are slightly green because we're doing a lot of work around ESG and sustainability reporting at the moment. Um, Ashley's definitely leading the charge there. Um, but uh, you can see that again, the team is growing. I will point out Anita Schluka is leading the charge on lease accounting. Uh, she's amazing. Um, and then, you know, she works with Anneli van Amerva on it. She works with Ryan on it. She works with Lara Erasmus on it. She works with Julie um, in Brisbane on it. So just on the screen, five people that focus on lease accounting, and we've just hired another two. So um, please reach out to us. We would love to help you. Um, I want to say thank you very much that you um, enjoyed this flyover with us. Um, we hope you find it useful. Um, and that there's some food for thought. If you need help, that's why we're here. Uh, we want to help our clients. We want to help management be ready for conversations with auditors um, and for conversations with their boards. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you have a lovely day. Kevin, Ashley, goodbye and thank you. Thanks, Aletta. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Aletta. Thanks, Bye. Ashley. Bye.